um, yeah, having got halfway through oh, with no sound, I'm going to go back to the beginning and start again. <laughs> so sorry about that. Let me start again. Let me take you through and we've got sound. So that's good. Thank you very much guys for pointing that out. Uh, don't, yeah, it's, um, it's difficult when you haven't got technical support on the background, but, um, yeah let's go again so hi i'm john your concierge to the world of the raspberry pi bico iot robotics and other fun tech so welcome to my channel um this is my live stream which is more relaxed um look at the world of the pico uh sometimes with sound sometimes without sound um who knows uh but uh um you know Stay tuned for a rundown on some of the exciting news, or I think it's exciting, in the Pico um, ecosystem, and an update on my plans for the channel. Um, if it's your first time watching the channels, thank you very much for joining. Uh, please think about liking and subscribing. If you're returning, then thank you very much for coming back. I do appreciate it. Um, so, how are you? Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you can now hear me and, you know, hope the Pico projects are going well. I'm back on my feet after a small operation in January. Um, so I'm feeling a lot better now. I've got rid of the gallstone and excited to get back to work. So, so lots to do. And I'm just catching up on trying to build up a bit of a backlog of uh, video blogs ready for the channel. Because, as you probably guessed, not everything always goes exactly to plan. And it's good to have a bit of a buffer so that when my projects don't quite go right, I can do something about it. Um, in fact, I keep thinking about doing an episode on the stuff that goes wrong. Because it does. It goes wrong in my project. I'm sure it goes wrong in your projects too. And, um, you know, I think it's sometimes nice to recognize that you know things aren't always quite as uh perfectly uh perfectly clean white shirted as uh, i perhaps like to try and portray um you know it things do go wrong the dirty code code is hard and uh yeah i i, I and i make some very wonderfully silly mistakes at the time at times that uh keep me uh stumbling so what, what are I going to talk about in today's episode? Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, news on the Pico uh, and stuff that I think is going on, uh, a bit around my projects and some of the projects I've been working on and playing with, a bit about where I'm going with uh, Dr. John EA as uh, a channel, and uh, then some Q&A, uh, hopefully. So... Let's start with some news around the Pico, RP2040 and any other exciting tech that comes along. So I guess to start with, um, the big news coming into December was the launch of the Raspberry Pi 5. And yes, okay, this was big news, but it actually has had quite an interesting little bit of a knock-on effect on the world of the Raspberry Pi Pico and Pico SDK development. As some of you probably know, I write courses for Udemy around the Pico and some of my students have reported a lot of problems trying to use the Raspberry Pi 5 as their build engine. And that was on Ubuntu 2310 and Raspberry Pi OS Bookworm. And it comes down to um, them not really being able to, or the platform out of the box not working with the debug probe from Raspberry Pi or a Pico probe if you build your own for SWD um, pro, uh, SWD uh, flashing. And this is due to missing UDEV rules that were, I'm sure, prevalent uh, there on the previous version of those operating systems, but are now not. Um, now, I've got a video talking about how to fix this coming up in um, the next couple of weeks. Uh, but if you need the fix urgently, um, drop me a message and I'll let you know how to, to fix it. It really is essentially putting in a simple UDEV file and uh, it will go, uh, 
all our problems will go away. Um, the other change that we've seen on the Raspberry Pi um, 5 for development purposes is the mo or more debug purposes is the move to GDB multi arc or multi arch for debugging. Um, that's not a huge surprise because we've seen Mac convert over to that and Linux has converted over to that for their build environments as well. So uh, GDB multi arc is, yeah, was not surprising to see Raspberry Pi catch up on that too. Staying on the Pico SDK, um, I noticed that the um, quick start guide over on Raspberry Pi's site has had quite a major update. Um, there is some new stuff in there. Um, it's worth a scan through. Um, there's also some stuff that's not in there that used to be in there. And one of those is the um, Pico SDK um, window quick install. So to install that just by downloading that binary off of GitHub and, it, and running and installing, that's no longer talked about in that guide, which worried me a bit. I don't know if that's going away. Certainly it is still available on GitHub right now. But um, yeah, that, that's, uh, there's a bit of news that surprised me. Um, hopefully it's still going to be supported because it really is a nice, quick and easy way to get users up and running on C and C++ development environments for the Pico. The other big news I think uh, launched this or in January was FreeRTOS kernel version 11, um, which is a merge of the SMP, symmetric multiprocessing capability with the, uh, the rest of uh, the FreeRTOS kernel. Um, and this is great because it also supports RP2040 and the Pico. Um, I talk a bit more about this later and I'll, I've all, of course done a, a, a bigger video on this, but it is a big one for me because most of my projects use FreeRTOS. So um, it's got to be one of the big pieces of news uh, available for the Pico that came out um, this year. The other bit of news that I picked up on was the launch of TensorFlow Lights uh, Pico update. So uh, Tensor TensorFlow, if you haven't come across it, is an open source machine learning framework based on deep learning neural networks. Um, it span out of Google back in about 2015. The new version now supports dual core on the Pico, which I think is great and speeds up the algorithms. So they're quoting things like a person detection algorithms now sped, uh, sped up by 1.4 times the speed, which is cool because the only people detection algorithm I did, and you might remember it from Robot Santa back in, in December, was actually running on the Raspberry Pi 4. I was only actually using the Pico for doing servo motor movements and things. So, um, being able to do people detection on a Pico might be quite interesting, especially as we now have cameras supporting Picos as well. They're monochrome, but that's okay because you normally do people detection in, in monochrome anyway. Um, it's something I might take a look at at a future date. My only reservation is the little amount of RAM available on a Pico for doing image management and image manipulation, but certainly it's good to have frameworks like TensorFlow Lite available to us. So those are the new stories I picked up on. Um, were there any I missed? Um, do let me know in the comments and I can include them next time. So what projects have I been working on? Well, you've seen a lot of the stuff already on the channel because I try and get them into my uh, video blogs on the channel when I can. So you will have seen uh, probably the most fun I've had this year on a project which was OTA, the over-the-air update of the firmware on the Raspberry Pi Pico W. Uh, and that was using the library by Jacob Zimnall. Um, that was great. Um, it 
there is something incredibly satisfying of being able to download binary code directly onto your Pico and get your Pico then to actually just switch to running that code. Um, uh, very, very cool. I was had probably as big a uh, smile on my face as my AI uh, colleagues there um, in the image uh, uh, bouncing across the uh, lobby floor. So uh, if you haven't seen that video, go take a look. It's well worth uh, a watch and having a play with that because, um, yeah, I think um, certainly uh, we'll be making its way into some of my projects in the future. Uh, and I've already touched on FreeOTOS kernel um, and I did a video blog uh, checking out the new version. Um, I was interested in how easy it is to get to basically switch from single core to dual core operation in free Autos kernel. Um, certainly it used to be a little bit of a pain because it was a separate branch of the kernel on, on the GitHub. It had slightly uh, inconsistencies with its build process um, and uh, therefore switching from one to the other wasn't really very easy. Now with the version 11, it actually is really easy. And I then sort of baselined it in performance just to see, you know, are you getting a significant uplift when you're going from single to dual core on FreeRTOS? And yes, you are. Um, how does it compare against single core and dual core bare metal? Um, uh, not badly at all. In fact, single core um, FreeRTOS kernel um, actually beat the performance of bare metal single core which surprised me for some while until I worked out that I think it's heat management that's doing it. Uh, the heat management from FreeRTOS is, is running a little bit quicker and the algorithm I was running was doing an awful lot of dynamic memory allocation. So anyway, really quite an interesting one. Uh, go check out that video if you haven't seen it. Not every project I've been working on has made it as far as YouTube. Um, so I've been pay playing a little bit with pogo pins uh, and not pongo pins, pogo pins. Um, and uh, if you remember, I was playing with the, hang on, if you remember, I was playing with the Pimeroni's um, uh, galactic unicorns displays, which have got a Pico W already um, soldered onto the back. Now the problem with that is that you can't then really add anything into those SWD ports. Um, certainly soldering SWD from the front, I think for me, is gonna kill my Pico W because there's a, a, um, a tiny little resistor right next to that port that I'm gonna hit. I'm not gonna manage to, to avoid that. Um, so I've been, started development and working on this using boot cell as my approach to uploading code and it was painful um i i really can't go back to doing boot cell i need i need a debugger from time to time i need to just be able to I issue code updates from from my terminal and not go and touch the back of units all the time to to get it into boot cell mode um so yeah i i needed something so what I ended up doing is playing with these pogo pins and actually building myself on a little bit of perf board, a, um, a, a little tiny um, plug board that will actually just sit on the back of the unit, held on there with a, 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 a clip and can actually get enough connection for me to use SWD. And these pogo pins are basically just copper pins with uh, little spring-loaded caps on the end. Um, they're really good. Uh, I was really actually quite impressed at how how well and how easily this works um, for, a, for a little tiny build. Um, I've not, and as you see, I'm just using a, you know, a um, woodworking sort of uh, clamp there to just hold it in place. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't know whether people want me to uh, put one of this up as a full video and talk about it in a bit more detail. Could happily do that. Let me know if, you, if you'd be interested. And uh, we can, I can do a video on the pogo pins and how to use them in these 
projects. So let's have a chat about the channel and where I'm going with the channel and what my plans are. I guess the the first thing to say is um, I'm obviously playing around a little bit with branding and imagery at the moment, trying to get my site to, and my channel to have an identity and you know to feel comfortable and feel recognizable. I want Dr. John EA to be a home away from home where you can ask questions of a knowledgeable guide, hopefully me, um, plus some of my friends and colleagues. Um, you know, where, you know, that provide that concierge service to your technical questions, exhibit projects and show, show them off and share tutorials. Um, so I'm going with this concept of this hotel backdrop and concept, um, making this a unique place, um, but hopefully one that's comfortable and recognizable. And hopefully that comes across and works okay. Um, but we'll see. I'm, I'm playing and evolving and learning. And, you know, I continue to learn and I, I look at my um, likes and view stats every day. Um, I've just signed up to a one of these online AI uh, coaching services for coaching your YouTube channel and, and the statistics and to help me work out how to improve and what, what's good, what works and what isn't. Um, its analysis is quite interesting because um, it feels I should do more two minute to four minute min videos. Um, that's, I think that's that's tricky but interesting and I've been trying to think about how to take that uh, feedback on and actually add it into my world. So as you already know I do a full video blog each week which is between 10 minutes and 30 minutes in length. I also try and do a short each week where I try to put a concept over in about 30 seconds. I think I have more work to do on shorts. Um, it's hard getting something out in 30 seconds and perhaps I need to um, excite rather than educate in, in that 30 seconds. Um, I don't know. That's something I, I keep thinking about. I need to do some more work on that. But taking this guide's advice, I'm going to trial adding a third video a week. Uh, and it won't be an entirely new concept though, because I just don't have that much time. Uh, what I'm going to do is do a basically an up to three minute summary of the full video. So trying to put out um, you know, a quick catch up on the stuff that I've done and covered. So that gives me a broadcast schedule where at 1400 uh, GMT um, on my broadcast dates, I'm going to put out uh, content. So on Thursday, it will be the full video blog. On Sunday, it will be a short. And on a Tuesday, it will be the three minute summary. And we'll see how it goes and we'll see what you got um, you guys like it let me know what you think um, at, when they come out and uh, I will keep adapting and seeing how to make this as useful a, a use of your time as possible and as fun as possible do also keep an eye on my social media channels and stuff I put content out on Instagram X, Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. Um, now, I do know that they are mainly reels of cut down YouTube content. So if you've watched the YouTube content, you might think they're not very much interesting. Um, yep, okay, fair, fair comment. Um, Instagram, I am doing something slightly uh, additionally with as well. I'm putting out, a, a, or trying to put out a story most days of stuff that I'm actually working on and so what's actually going on. So it's more of an inside or a behind the scenes view of my world, if you like. So if you're interested in stuff that's coming up or things that I'm actually working on or going on um, and you want a little bit of a nose, then have a look at my Instagram feed and uh, do follow me please on Instagram. So 
we get as far as Q and A. Um, so I've not had much in the way of question and answers uh, to drive this so far. So um, I'm really interested in getting some more questions in for for future live streams. If you are, you know, one, th you know, saying that. One question that we did have this week, I thought was quite interested, which was from Martin on uh, shared libraries and should we really be putting shared libraries in our project folder or should they actually be a shared folder that we're actually pulling all our projects from the same libraries? Um, and I thought that was really quite an interesting uh, question. Um, certainly I, I do do that for uh, use a shared folder from time to time, the projects have to be really closely connected um, because what I don't want is to have a large amount of work in the future when I'm going to actually have to upgrade stuff. Um, I want to be able to rebuild things. I want to be able to rebuild to the same version that I have previously, uh, generally. And so um, my advice is to tend is to keep local copies of the uh, pro libraries in your actual project folders because that way you can go back to that version of the library rather than trying to then one when you're trying to rebuild it in six months nine months three years time actually having to then work out how to do all of the upgrading in order to make it work so um, yeah my my advice is definitely to keep things simple um, uh, in local projects to to avoid the, the upgrade pane if you don't need to upgrade. Let me just check to see. Uh, uh, so apart from questions on why you can't hear anything, which is my own silly fault, uh, no actual questions on board. So we will not answer any more questions. And But if you do have anything that comes up, I think there's stuff worth talking about or my opinion on um, that you know, others might be interested in, then please uh, give me a shout and we can we can go from that. So that's it for today. Um, I'll do another live stream in March. Um, let me know what you think of the live stream and please do let me know some questions for next time as well. I will keep trying to put a Q&A slot in. Um, please like and please subscribe. I really do appreciate it. Um, and uh, keep tinkering with those projects. Um, goodbye for now. Bye-bye.